Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of RI's T-Day Tuesday. Our special guest for today is another honorary fellow and doctor fellow of Royal Institution Singapore. He's a director and board member of Global Maritime Education and Training Limited Australia. He's a prominent maritime professional, master marineer, and former industrialist from Singapore now residing in Australia. He has more than five decades of engagement and participation in the maritime transport and logistics business and operations, having served in the diverse sectors in shipping, shipbuilding, and maritime logistics operations. Let us all welcome Honorable Dr. Fellow Captain Dr. Richard Kiel. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, thank you for that. So thank you for um, joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure indeed. So the goal of, of this interview is to open up the discourse surrounding the pandemic we are facing today. So we want to reiterate that this pandemic continues to have huge effects on the current state of the world. So even though we are isolated from each other, we hope that through proper communication of pertinent information, we can be better informed, aware, and mindful of the situation. So how was uh, the situation in our area, sir? Well, in, in, when you say in my area, do you mean the industrial area or the uh, country that I'm currently oh, in? The country that you're <clears throat> in. Uh, it, it's been, it's been uh, a shock to everyone uh, to experience this COVID-19, uh, which although the country itself has emergency response plans, the, uh, the speed in which information travel was probably not as quickly as, as it should have been. But nonetheless, um, we did all the things that was required and, and shut down uh, industries as quickly as is possible. Those that are essential ones kept on going. And, and in phases, we even uh, stopped schools from happening. Uh, of course, uh, this gave us all the opportunity to have online learning for kids as well as for adults. So that, in, in reality, is I don't think it affected us very hardly, uh, but certainly uh, it did make everyone realize that they, you know, you got to do things as, as uh, collaborative as is possible and not try to be too much of an individual. And that's the actual impact. Now, I don't think we need to say too much more about how, how it actually all happened and so on and so forth. It's all over the news, so. But uh, the reality is, um, what, what else would you like to, to ask about the, uh, the impact that really, um, you know, uh, made us worry about what the future is going to be? Do you have any ideas on what you'd like to what you'd like to know about that? Um, actually, uh, what I would like uh, maybe to um, to ask is that um, what are in the maritime sector, for example, how does it um, affect greatly or drastically in the maritime, the logistics, the shipping industry? <clears throat> All right. Look, it's it's a very wide. Uh, area of concern. Uh, I'll just go through a little bit of the time. In general, shipping is not affected. Shipping continues. But shipping can only continue if the factories come back online and start producing again. Right, so for the first, I think, uh, three to four weeks, there's a lot of backlog of, of uh, goods and services that have to be completed. So I don't think that hampered shipping at all, okay? What will hamper shipping, of course, is the people on board the ships. Uh, the, the seafarers are working in a very isolated, uh, you know, area of industry where a ship goes away and is in, at sea for, for umpteen days and weeks and they are cut off from civilization to a very high degree. So in that respect, the people working on ships were probably not as prepared as they should have been for this particular starting as an epidemic and then become a pandemic. Uh, how the, the, the seafarers, uh, uh, you know, come to the ball game and understand what it's all about 
is something that communications did not quite um, it all was not quite as good as it should be and we learned from that lesson that uh, whatever uh, response uh, 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 response plan that we have uh, probably needs a lot of um, reimagining and rethinking and reconstructing the standard operating procedure that is required now that's just for people working on ships the biggest hit was the cruise industry passengers living in in highly concentrated areas became clusters and the amount of attention given to this was very very little uh, you got ships that carry a doctor but the doctor's dispensary and clinic on board those cruise ships were not set up to be able to handle even the simple testings all right it's a new new disease so the test equipment may not be suitable but there wasn't any of that that was of any kind of use at all and and so the uh, actual i suppose operations of allowing cruise ships to enter ports uh, was not as stringent as they should have been uh, the amount of uh, uh, i suppose that the lack of uh, attention to detail in the clearing inwards of a ship which we call free critique or uh, you know how does the ship not go to quarantine but can go straight alongside the the particular port and then you know let the passengers off and enjoy themselves so i think that part of it was very slack and in in my in my community work i actually meet and greet cruise ships coming in 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 the port of burnie here uh i was quite surprised to see that you know uh in in the case of the ruby princess that she was allowed to sail out with a new group of passengers you know uh, without actually any kind of investigation having been carried out for the first time she came into into sydney but that having having said that um the general atmosphere at the time uh that was generated was not one of fear and not one of of distress it was like it's okay we can handle it uh which didn't turn out to be the truth that there were problems and until now i don't know whether we've still sorted them out yet the investigation prevails and one of the 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 uh, most tragic thing that comes up from all this is as a seafarer and as a person from shipping industry i am very concerned that now investigation is trying to pin something on the captain and crew because people have died and tracing backwards um the the cruise ships did have some contribution to the carrying of the virus and retransmitting it from person to person as well as on ship as well as when they go ashore and the worst part is when they all return home after having disembarked having returned home the people that they would have met along the way is very hard to track so we're thankful that now we've got a tracking device we have software now that can track and i hope you've also got that in the in the philippines <clears throat> uh if you don't have i think you can download it from the web the australian government has has offered it free to everyone uh and uh, if you or friends and relatives have been um, uh, visitors to australia in, in the recent recent past download that covid-19 um tracker and uh it it does not uh, interfere with your privacy at all what it does do is it will record someone who might have some sort of uh, previous uh face to face meeting 
thing or just passing by someone else who has been a carrier or has been infected. And it helps the tracking. Once the tracking, you know, can narrow down a lot more than what we, are pos what we can do now, helps the whole process of flattening that curve. We reduce the number of people being infected, means we can actually come up very quickly with controlling the spread. And, and that, that to me has become, you know, the, the major thing that we should all be thinking about, particularly for seafarers, because seafarers are traveling all over the world. They are still at work, 724. They haven't stopped work. In a lot of countries, we're not allowed to go back to work. You know, we have to stay at home, self-isolate. Self but seafarers, they have no choice. Their home is a ship. And so they have to work on board to make sure that the logistics and transportation of what is, you know, uh, essential for our lives continues. Uh, you probably have heard that the shipping delivers 90% of all the food that we consume in the world. Of this uh, 90%, if 10% stops moving, which is about 25% of goods and services uh, on an annual basis, uh, we all start to starve. We begin to starve. We will not get the food, especially in imported foods. And if uh, just as well, if we don't export to the other countries the food stuff that we grow in various countries, then we will also not receive the food. And so the, uh, the natural, uh, uh, I suppose, result of all that would be people will start to starve. And, and that would be a terrible tragedy. So, of course, um, under such circumstances, the world wants to quickly go back to work. So economically wise, yes, it's important. But health wise, maybe not so good. So it's a toss up. Uh, each country that has been keeping good records have been tracking their, their, their infection rate uh, will, it looks like, start to go back to industry, start to go back to work, start to kickstart everything again uh, in stages. Um, <clears throat> education is one of the first ones to, to go back, I think. Uh, not so much where I am because I am very near to the epic center, the epicenter in the northwest part of Tasmania. So the northwest part of Tasmania is still in lockdown. And uh, I respect that requirement, although I actually need to go to work. <laughs> but so working from home has become, you know, quite quite a quite an easier, quite easier to 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 work than to rush back and forth. You know, so I, I think um, most everyone will probably uh, don't really want to rush back to work. <laughs> you know, just make sure that uh, everything's running smoothly. Anyhow, that's, that's what I think is. Um, uh, outside of that particular area, um, we still need to know how and when this virus came upon us. And I'm hoping that the powers that be, you know, the, the countries that, and uh, WHO can work together. We can have a, a better, better operating procedure for tackling another <coughs> outbreak like this. So urgent answers, urgent solutions, urgent strategies for, for commercial ships at sea, and uh, certainly uh, much, much more need to be, uh, uh, you know, looked into and the, the, uh, the discovery of all the uh, new ways and better ways that we can help uh, cruise ships perform and keep them healthy and safe all the time. It's very hard when you have 4,000 passengers on board and 4,000 crew. And it's all very close contact all the time. Uh, for those of you who may have been on a cruise ship before, it's really good fun. It's really nice to be traveling in company with friends and so on and so forth. But it is a, a, a very um, 
dense cluster of people. You know, and, and when they had to self-isolate in their cabins, I really uh, felt sorry for them. Because in some of these uh, cruise ships, where you try to go at the, at the most economical rate, down, 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 inside the ship, there are no windows. And if you close your doors, it is claustrophobic. Yeah. You might enjoy that special togetherness you know, uh, for a day or so. <laughs> but after a while, I think it will become very, very claustrophobic. But that's where it is. And uh, I'm thinking now maybe, you know, uh, cruise ships will have to rethink their, the way they carry the passengers. And certainly uh, the, <clears throat> the ship's hospitals that are a standard feature for all passenger ships and cruise ships, uh, we, we see it was not adequate to look after everyone. Um, and this, that should be another area where, where um, the, I suppose the uh, training of uh, seafarers comes in. And we gotta make sure that seafarers actually have better understanding of medical procedures better understanding of uh, health requirements. Every ship, every ship has got a clinic on board. By law, we must carry a, a scale of medicines for everyone to use, but they are all for common ailments. Yeah? The uh, ship master's training includes some medical training, but they're again for emergencies only, like uh, childbirth, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, you know, even, even uh, an appendicitis, we, we are trained to be able to take it out, you know, uh, on instructions by, by this sort of communication nowadays we have face to face with a surgeon somewhere that we can go through the whole procedure together with the surgeon. But it's not good enough. It's not good enough. And, and certainly, uh, how do we rethink on the scale of provisions, <clears throat> the scale of medical requirements on board a ship becomes a very urgent feature now. Uh, not just, you know, for cruise ships, but, you know, even ferries. In, 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 in Philippines, ferries churn out a lot of people back and forth in the inland sea. And uh, although they only short trips, uh, it's going to be very hard if an epidemic does uh, start from a ferry ship with you know 1,500 people on board. Uh, how do you contain it when everyone is sleeping in bunks side by side? You know, the, I, I don't know whether you've you've sailed on those ferry ships from Cebu to Mindanao. You are sleeping side by side on an open deck. You know, it's covered. It's quite quite uh, quite comfortable but it is close quarters all the time. So in a situation like that, how would we control, you know, an outbreak of a disease like COVID-19? That may be a problem. So again, um, <clears throat> our standard operating procedures on ships will change drastically. I think a lot of people are already working on it. IMO has come out, the International Maritime Organization has come out with certain guidelines already on how uh, uh, ships should uh, um, look after themselves, particularly in the health of, of seafarers and so on and so forth. But yes, that is the main contention now, is uh, one of great worry. And I hope we'll get through this well in the next few weeks or so. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So thank you for that um, explanation or brief, brief explainer of the situation. COVID situation in the maritime industry, in the cruise ship and transportation sector. So, sir, uh, my next question is, so uh, you've mentioned that you're working uh, from home now. So, since daily life now is so different from the way it was before, how can we begin to rebuild our home lives and our work lives? That's really, you know, each individual might come up with a different way to do it. But the reality is, working from home, depending on the, on the job that you are doing, uh, senior managers 
can lead wherever they are, whether in the office, traveling, or you know, on assignment somewhere else in, in, in another, another country. So I don't think it affects senior managers very much. But what it will affect is the lower strata workers who are working a you know, set task skills sets um, every day. If, how are they going to bring that home? Like a, a factory worker can't, can't bring that work home. You know, uh, even a, a, a typist, you know, uh, can that typist bring the work home? There's still going to be contact because on completion or right nowadays, we've, we've probably got uh, better communications with, uh, with uh, Wi-Fi and all that, that the person can, can talk to the boss and, and type out whatever the boss wants and send it back on the wire. Uh, I suppose that sort of work can go uninterrupted. After a while, you get the routine, right? And this is what I'm doing right now, I'm because I'm working at home, and our clerical staff is in the next town, and they are now working from home. So basic functions like going to the bank is not possible anymore, because the bank, again, has got these uh, uh, social distancing rules. So the individuals, you know, uh, can't even get through the front door, some, some banks. You can't sort of do telework at the, at the doorway. So, but you can do deposits and things like that. And thankfully, we do have a lot of online services for payments and things like that in place. So some of that, yes, will not be affected, but the actual face-to-face -face like, um, doing international transfers. Depending on the banks you use, the bank we use here, uh, the branches are not allowed to handle international transfers. So we've got to fill up the forms physically and transmit those forms to them by hand. We cannot send it through electronically, right? So what happens is we, we, we do everything manual, and then we bring the, the, uh, the the, the TT forms to the bank. They've got to see our face to make sure that we are who we are <laughs> and not <laughs> sending money uh, through somebody else's bank account. And then they have, they're satisfied. They check the signatures. They're satisfied. Then that transfer then goes to the head office where they handle all the international transfers. Now they can do that because they have got recognition, uh, what do you call it, um, um, devices amongst themselves. Uh, we as a customer is put to great, um, I suppose, uh, you know, discomfort to have to go and stand at, at, the, at the door, handing out our forms, and wait for them to go through and make sure that the signatures are correct. And then uh, they'll say, okay, then we'll inform you later on that the, the transfer has gone through. So that is the extra bit of uh, uh, hassle that most people will face. But I think eventually, once people get used to a routine, I think most of us will be able to work from home other than the actual production workers. So um, seafarers, of course, home is the ship. So they are working there 724 and coming home uh, on the holiday breaks, one would not expect them to work at all. Um, I'm afraid the seafarer probably um, is, is a workforce that never sleeps, so to speak. <laughs> you know? Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about your personal, personal advice um, in dealing with this situation? Because we covered, you covered the shipping who's and... Mm. Uh, for each for for each individual, you know, you've got your own priorities, and uh, you need to look at what your priorities are. That something like this, if it happens again, <clears throat> where is your your um, place of work? Uh, do you have to travel far every day to go to work? 
uh, are you able to do a certain percentage of the work that you do at the office at home? There's a lot of planning required to make sure that, that you've divided your time and divided your traveling to a minimum to be able to still produce the same quantity of work that you do normally at the office. Um, again, I don't think senior managers and leaders have a problem. They can work from anywhere. They should be able to work from everywhere. If they can't, then there's something wrong with them. You need to get rid of them. They will not be good, good senior managers and good leaders. Um, the, the juniors, because they need more supervision or still continue to require supervision, then <clears throat> their time at the office is, is probably going to uh, only be able to coincide with it when the seniors are around. Uh, to be able to counsel them. Otherwise, back to the old telephone system, back to, you know, talking through um, video conferences and things like that. But how, how do you sort of, uh, you know, create opportunities for communications to be, you know, without interruption? And I, I can give you a, an example right now. I run a small team and this small team uh, we are connected by Zoom right throughout the day on the phone. So we can talk to each other all the time by the Zoom or by just normal phone calls or by normal video calls. We are connected. But which means that wherever you are, your materials that you carry with you need to be on hand to be able to talk, you know, uh, uh, I suppose, um, effectively about what the work might be. Now, how are you going to do that? Okay, you can load a lot of stuff into your phone. You can load a lot of stuff into your laptop or your iPad. But searching for information means you've got to stop the <laughs> conversation every now and then, isn't it? So how, how, how do we do that? Again, I suppose, you know, it's new skills we have to learn. And... Uh, Memory better be good. <laughs> uh, as you get older, your memory is going to suffer a little bit. You know? So you, you need to have your, your, your notes and stuff with you. So, so we go back to what we call the uh, traveling salesman who carries his entire kit with him wherever he goes to sell his products. You know? And I laugh at this a, a little bit because I'm a bit like that. You know, in, in, in my present line of work, I carry my office with me. So my briefcase, well, it's no longer a briefcase, it's a little suitcase now, <laughs> with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, information and even files and folders that normally I would leave in the office. But now I need to carry duplicates with me so that at least for the last seven days of things that has happened, I've got that with me, so that when I need to reject my memory a little bit, I can open a folder and have read through. Um, putting it all on soft, soft files uh, is an option, mm -hmm. but I, I find it, uh, I suppose I'm still a bit old fashioned. I, I like looking at a piece of paper like this, you know, and, and uh, it, it makes things easier for me. So again, depending on the individual, depending on, you know, uh, how your 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 work life is is structured, mm -hmm. and uh, what sort of work do you do that uh, might need a lot of information records on tap? Don't forget, if you're high up in the hierarchy enough, you might have a secretary somewhere who knows everything. <laughs> and again, a lot of a lot of business businesses now we 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 share secretaries, and uh, wonderful ladies. They always know every, everything. You know, just like that. <laughs> I don't know how uh, that that might happen. Um, as as you get more more things to do and more, uh, I suppose, units of uh, of um, business in your company that you have to look after, uh, I would think that that becomes more and more difficult to be traveling and working at the same time, and then working from home. From home would be easier because you can stock up another library in your office, uh, in your office at home. 
Um, but if you are moving around all the time, it would be quite difficult. But again, it, you know, people are very versatile, and uh, how do we uh, effectively, you know, um, look after ourselves to make sure that we can do all that? You know, is is a challenge. It's a challenge. I see you with us, Samuel. How are you? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. How are things with you? Yeah, uh, we are locked down in Manila, the Philippines. So, where are you now? You are in Australia or Singapore? I'm in in Burnie, Tasmania, and oh. I yeah, and I happen to be in the uh, epicenter of the northwest region of Tasmania. Uh, where we've had this outbreak, we've had this outbreak from ex-passengers and people who were in contact with ex-passengers on the cruise ships. Oh, and yes, yes, and and uh, we've had the hospital nearest to me uh, had had to shut its doors, send all the um, patients to another hospital in another town, and uh, mm -hmm. disinfect the whole hospital. From top to bottom. Oh, it's it's good. Uh, so you are you are uh, you are trained to <laughs> you are trained to handle all those things. After all, to some degree, but you know, I, I think this is where I think we have to relook at the the um, training required for seafarers. That uh, seafarers normally are quite unconcerned about diseases, outbreaks, and all that. Where you know, over over the, the many centuries of Captain Cook and Darwin, uh, we've been able to you know uh, uh, provide medicines and cures for the various diseases that that have uh, been common on board ships in the old days. Uh, not so much these days because ships have got good sanitation nowadays and certainly uh, good quality food and well-trained crew in hygiene and so on and so forth. So to some degree, yes, uh, we, we feel that we probably will not be, be affected too much, but it's so easy to catch something. You know, the ship goes into port, the ship goes into port, and the crew goes ashore for a couple of hours for a bit of a wander around and, 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 and you know, a, a, something to eat and enjoy themselves. It's easy to pick up diseases from anywhere. And with COVID-19, COVID-19, there were so many confusing uh, reports on how it can be transmitted that people took it easy, you know? So that yeah. became... Yes. Now, uh... I, I suppose you are contemplating to come up with new courses in uh, maritime education. I don't think we should bring, yeah. I don't think we should bring in, any new courses. We should include in yeah, the curriculum, in, yes. Yeah. Too many courses. And, yeah. Yeah, we'll be See, the, over the years, over, over the years, a lot of the old learning was removed, you know. My contemporaries, oh. my contemporaries learn a lot extra things that today is not required because everyone is saying everything is modern nowadays. You know, medical you know, helicopter can pick you up anytime. You can for individual cases, but you can't for something like COVID-19. And I don't think the present day shipmasters are prepared very well for emergencies like this. Uh, thank goodness the communications is better now. But can you imagine if this happened, you know, uh, 20 years ago when communication wasn't so good? Uh -huh. we, we, we would have a lot of problems. But even then, by the same token, the, the rules and regulations need, need to be looked at again. Uh, ship coming in to port with, with um, people who are disease-stricken or infected. Uh, how do we help that ship? At this point in time, there was no help really given. The whole uh, population was against the ship even uh, coming into port. You know, so if if the ship needs help, 
how are we going to help them? Even to try and get the sick ones ashore, there was a big uproar from the public. <laughs> you know? So that's, that's one area that needs to be investigated thoroughly and to make sure that, uh, you know, that we who are not sick can help those who are sick and, and, and then help them prevent, you know, any more infection. Uh, I think most of most of public don't understand this. The uh, the doctors did, but the doctors are not allowed to do many things, you know. And uh, the regulators, of course, um, were at a complete loss because the public demand. And of course, again, you know, I don't know how much of it was apparent in in the in the Philippines, but here the politicians were very much afraid of upsetting the public. So yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So the, uh, the the ship, the the cruise ships had to wait for you know the right things to happen for them. And early on, I spoke about the the uh, the manslaughter charges that will be you know become a problem um, because the investigation is saying the ship is at fault. Uh, the maybe at four, but is performing a certain, you know, when, when something like it hits you, it hits you, you know, you, you, you don't know it's going to hit you. And, uh, but the, the investigation is a criminal investigation, it's not an investigation to find out just root causes, you know, it's, it's a criminal one because people have died. So, to some, some, some public even talking about murder charges, you know. So let's hope it doesn't go that far. Let's hope that um, the seafarer is not going to be, you know, labeled as as the fault for this sort of thing. And unfortunately, um, the disease, the way it was trans transmitted, was people were unsure. Uh, WHO could not give us definite answers. And then yes. uh, when, when they were trying to give definite answers, there were big shot politicians saying differently, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. That's also my observation. That's why we are confused. Yes. We are yes. confused. And it's not good for everyone. But, you know, I mean, this general call for collaboration now to come up with the um, solutions. But uh, there's a bit, bit more quiet now from that side of the world where, where there's been so much um, inflammatory remarks being said. Um, we hope that uh, the actual collaboration does take, take, take place and uh, we'll know what to do in future. I mean, we, this is the first time a vaccine is ready in three months. Now, you, you can't. The whole process is a year to 18 months. So now we've got vaccine within three months. Now, who are they going to so test it on? <laughs> what, what, what will happen to the seafarers, seafarers? I am very concerned. I am very concerned. I, I posted a few questions like this on LinkedIn. Nobody wants to answer. You know, professionals are keeping very quiet. Uh, I speak to some of my politician friends, of course, they're full of bluster as usual. Everything they know, can do, can do, can do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's doubtful that anything can, you know, can. Happen. We have many mm -hmm. shipperers from the Philippines are coming back. Coming You've got home. The most, well, that's yeah. right. <clears throat> uh, the Ruby Princess is bringing back about 800 Filipino sailors. So yeah. it will affect definitely our uh, economy. It will. It will. It's affected everyone. It's affected everyone. The, uh, the, the least affected ones will be those, I think, out of China. Because China, when all this happened, they were just beginning their Chinese New Year holidays. So for the best part, of two weeks before the February the 25th, 
and then 15 days later, another two weeks, so you're looking at six weeks, that they have no production anyway. No workers, no production anyway. So annually, they, they would not have felt that economic you know, downturn. Of course, mm -hmm. now we've gone past that, that 15 days after New Week, Chinese New Year, and, and they're starting to go back. So they would have lost, I think, about three weeks of production, four weeks of production, which they can bring back very quickly. But the problem now is, who's buying? <laughs> Who are buying? Um, <laughs> yes. People got no money oh. to buy. <laughs> so even oil price went down to zero. <laughs> yeah, nobody, nobody is using. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very distressing, and even in uh, education sector, it is greatly affected also. Well, the um, the um, schools are starting to reopen here in Australia, not all together, but in stages. Each state will start their, their, their open dates according to how their their uh, tracking looks like. <clears throat> the uh, overseas students in Australia, you know, is thirty to forty percent of the economy. So if these students don't come back. Australia is in a lot of trouble. <laughs> the university yeah. cannot cannot continue, you know. And uh, how how that will uh, you know flush out in the long term over the next twelve months, eighteen months will be interesting to watch, you know, because um, a lot of students are complaining the uh, terrible treatment they receive when they when they return back to university. And uh, and um, they could not attend lectures. They were attending online lectures, but the online lectures uh, could not fulfill the requirements of the ongoing uh, learning and training. Uh, yes, you know, so not all subjects, not all courses can be done through online, especially in maritime. No, oh, maritime, especially, you've got to have so much face-to-face -face and practical applications. Yes. Yeah. We've got a problem here. I mean, my, my small training center in, in Darwin, uh, we stop face-to-face, -face, but we continue with uh, online. It's working out not bad, you know, it's quite good, but a lot of the assessments that must be practical have been put in the bayers, you know, yes. unless, unless they're, they're employers allow them to do it on their work vessel mm. but then a third party assessor must be appointed if the vessel is not in darwin <clears throat> if the vessel is in darwin then one of the trainers will go on board to to assess it from a distance again a lot of this assessment is you know is face to face you know yeah uh, or, and in some cases, you can be in the same wheelhouse doing all the maneuvers and all that, keeping, you know, at least 1.5 meters apart. You can. Um, uh, but it means, it means that um, the employer, uh, the employer must give you that time on board his vessel. Yes. And how many employers are going to allow that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Of course, so, uh, they will always... Uh, allowed to be employed they will accept employed employees based well, on they their, will uh, yeah skills <laughs> they will but some of them are trying to rush the thing through like you know oh don't worry about it just leave it to me you know i'll tell you whether he's fit or not fit we can't accept that <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes so uh, you know we aircraft aircraft very sensitive. It'll take some time for us to sort this out now, you know, because the whole world wants to run things online. But maritime is one area where online can be for the informative parts of courses and training, but for yeah, the actual in content, content subjects, mm. we do, but uh, 
skill subjects or programs yeah, have to be fixed. Will not yeah. will not be enough. That's right. And yeah. and there's one 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 concern. We have a lot of vendors in the market who swear blind that you don't need to have face to face, you know. And they're selling their products very well, and some countries are accepting it, you know. And uh, that will be the the main worry. So one of these days, um, we will get seafarers just trained from the computer and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And how how do we satisfy the complaints from employers when employers are the ones who allow them? You know, because all these all these new products are being sold through employers <clears throat> and employers who have their own training institutions might be able to adapt it well enough because if that individual employed by them when they're on at work on the ships they will be removed anyway but is it really fair on the individual you don't know yet you know because all these things are being pushed very, very quickly, very quickly. And I'm, I'm quite uh, concerned with a number of vendors now selling all sorts of electronic stuff, you know, that's uh, unproven. Um, but various jurisdictions are allowing it. Oh. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the, 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 the way it's all set up is IMO is, is not a regulator. IMO is a guidance sort of a, you know, United Nations thing. But they will come up with all sorts of resolutions and so on and so forth that you must follow as policy. The jurisdiction. So there are about uh, 200 countries. Of these 200 countries, each jurisdiction can do any way they want. So, yeah. There is and no this, standard. Yeah, right. There is no standard. That one, well, that they, they, they set the standard. Rule. They set the standard, you know. The, the standard that we've got is the STCW, but the STCW can be interpreted in so many ways. So the, the, the various jurisdictions that are in competition with you guys are the ones you've got to watch out for because they will, you know, cut short everything and produce as many seafarers as possible, you know. And, and flood the market. So where <clears throat> where an average uh, seafarer, able, able bodied seaman, may be getting about you know his basic salary about six or seven hundred dollars, uh, plus overtime all that, maybe maybe getting about a thousand dollars a month. Suddenly you find that some of these competitors will only be asking five hundred dollars. Because they have a very low cost of living, they're subsidized by their government, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> and suddenly you will lose a big chunk of your market. Yeah. So. So it is now relaxed. The standard is now relaxed. It is very relaxed in Middle Europe and Eastern Europe. Very relaxed. You know. Uh, in fact, if anything, now I think Philippines is getting more strict, you know, than than some of the Eastern European countries, and uh, because they many of them are ship owners and employing Filipinos, um, EMSA has a lot of say in in how they want our Filipino seafarers to be trained towards, and. Uh, you know, it's a never-ending sort of a, uh, I suppose, uh, contention that uh, we're not training our Filipino seafarers enough, which is quite untrue. There are one or two, you know, uh, in institutions that probably uh, are not following it exactly, because competency-based learning and competency-based training is a lot of practical work. And you can't you can't prove your skills and 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 uh, competency without demonstrating it. Yeah, that is the that is the <laughs> ultimate uh, requirement. That's right. Demonstration. Yeah. So we call that trade in examination. 
That's right. So you can't say someone has 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 a certificate of competence unless he has demonstrated or she has demonstrated exactly what needs to be done. Yeah, and, and that that is test, where three tests. we call that three tests. Yes, 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 and. Um, it's, it's slowly getting there, you know, but uh, I just worry that all these, all these software vendors, you know, will win the market, you know, and uh, then it'll be, you know, back to knowledge base only. <laughs> and uh, if, if you push too hard, you lose your market share. You don't push hard, then you know, then the skills will, will slowly erode. And uh, what's the happy balance? I don't know at this time what the happy balance is going to be. The, the fact is, jurisdictions just have got to be on the same level playing field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are so many jurisdictions. You know, Asian, ASEAN uh, organization doing as far as uh, recognition of uh, training schools among ASEAN, ASEAN countries yeah. recognize each other. They recognize each other as equals. So there's no problem with the recognition of certificates issued from any ASEAN country, except for Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste hasn't even got a shipping uh, department, so they can't issue any certificates of competency. Mm -hmm. But they are working towards uh, uh, developing a director general for shipping and uh, be able to then uh, certify their own people according to the standards. Um, but, you know, that country has been so, um, so used by all the United Nations advisors and, and and, and uh, consultants and everything else, that 15 years has gone by since independence. They still haven't got a shipping department. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what's going on? You know, I've been there several times to talk to those people. They, they all want to ship. Yeah, shipping industry is one of, I think that is the largest in terms of movement of products. Oh, yeah. 80%, 90% of the world products are moved by ship. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, right now, if, if you know, estimated if 25% of that shipping stops because there's nothing to carry, people start to starve because, you know, the, the majority of products being moved is food stuff. So food, for the hungry, and the countries that are producing food have to be able to produce in quickly enough now to fill up the uh, the empty ones. So this is a big rush for everyone to go back to production. Yeah. How is the movement of products in Australia now? Because Australia is one of the biggest producers of agricultural products mm. that's being exported. It continues, it continues, but the uh, the uh, production of food products are slowly transferring from Australian-owned industries to foreign-owned industries. So, like uh, we've just we've just lost our biggest dairy farm uh, to China. China organization with Australian interests have bought it over uh, with New Zealand interests involved as well. So the production of these dairy milk, dairy, dairy products will slowly move offshore. So Australia may lose its market share. Yeah. And again, this is the, again, this is the, uh, the uh, very political thing that, that, uh, most of the people I know here are farmers as well. Uh, they they are upset that they you know they've been facing so much difficulties over the last decade, uh, but they've received no assistance whatsoever from the government. 
So when someone comes around with a big fat check to buy your farm, what do you do? You know, take the money and run and retire. You know, no matter, no matter how much loyalty you've got, you've got to feed yourself and family first. You know? So this is one of the big social issues I think we will face in the very near future. Uh, our, our seed products um, are, are making good money. Again, um, we are the strictest food safety managers in the world. Well, how do we compete with countries that are also exporting seafood products with lesser standards? Yeah. So all these all these things will have a big knock-on effect on the Australian economy in the, in the near future. Australia has to rethink uh, how they can work their industries. Uh, how would they, you know? mechanized enough to offset the cost of labor um, and uh, become profitable again. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be easy, but it can happen. It can happen. But investors, investors again, uh, are, you know, very tough people. And uh, they only invest, and if it doesn't work, they pull out stakes and they go. And uh, then you're left holding the baby with you know, nothing to work on. And the unfortunate thing about um, a first world country is, when you become a first world country, your cost of living goes up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and everything you want to be top quality. But you're competing. You're competing with first world countries that are using third world countries to produce for them. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah, sir. Australia so has invested quite. So thank you very yes. much. Yeah. Are we over, yeah, over well, time? We're over time, are we? No, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we have a very um, productive interview and conversation. So my last question, sir, would be, uh, what is your advice to the general public um, for those who are affected, for our frontliners, for government, for every individual, for every family, for every worker uh, who are greatly affected by this pandemic? Mm. We, we probably had a disadvantage here to try and, and think of suitable strategies just over this little conversation we're having but hindsight now where we are we, we probably uh, realize that um, we were not ready for such a pandemic and we didn't have the tools and the instruments to fight it quickly enough and um, my advice if anybody listens to this is we should keep politics out of pandemics and and with so much politicking going on in this particular pandemic issue it hindered it hindered medical scientists from doing their jobs you know it hindered who from doing his job because of the politicizing of COVID-19. Um, it, it hindered, I think, individual countries in how we could have protected ourselves from the spread. And we, we are learning on a daily basis what we can do and what we cannot do and how we can go about doing all those things. And uh, my best advice to anyone is listen to your own government first. Because most governments now are following the same strategy. Some in stages, some all at once. But if public work together with government, we should be able to lick this problem and be ready for another one should it come. 
And collaboration is, is the best thing we can do. The public work with the government, government work with other governments, you know, WHO works together with all the other governments so that we can come up with a, a formal strategy, you know, and ensure that everyone is on the same page. It, it took so long for people to realize that social distancing is a good thing. And it was not a difficult thing to achieve. And yet it was politicized so badly that people just didn't want to do it. We still have in certain countries, people demonstrating against it, you know? Yeah. And, and so because there was no collaboration and there was no understanding between countries that, hey, this is probably the best thing we should all do. Let's do it together. We'll announce together, your country, my country, all together, you know, we'll announce that we will all go into this by the stages that we've decided each country has got some priority. They follow those priorities. And I think they would make us ready for the next one. We don't know when the next one is going to be, but if you, if you read between the, uh, the, uh, the reports, the, the lines between uh, in the reports, um, there's going to be a second wave. And uh, I think some of it is already starting to happen in China. And certainly Singapore got smashed, you know, because uh, they forgot about the um, foreign workers clustering of so many people in one or two dormitories, you know. Uh, and again, a, a country that like Singapore should have been long prepared for such a dense um, living uh, area, they were not. So overconfidence maybe, you know, no collaboration between the employers uh, and, and the government. The employers and the people who are housing all these people should have realized the danger already in the beginning. And, uh, you know, uh, the other thing, of course, is what it did expose is that these people living in those, uh, in those um, dormitories did not have have health care. So you can't employ thousands of people and put them in, in, in camps like that and not provide health care. So these are things that um, have come out. So when we have employees, we need to make sure that our employees enjoy the same health care that we have. Uh, if we neglect our employees, then everyone gets neglected along the path, you know. So looking after employees is a very important issue that uh, we all need to worry about. And in our case, of course, the seafarers are a very neglected uh, group of people when it comes to healthcare. We need to make sure that in all our schools and institutions where we train seafarers to become seafarers, the, 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 the importance of, of a healthy person it's so important to keep industry moving. And it didn't take much to stop a whole world from producing. Yeah. Yeah. What's, the, what's the number of cases now? One million cases. And 1.8 8 billion people stopped working. <laughs> you know, and it's only took one million cases to stop the world from working. That's imagine. So this is an area that we really need to look at very carefully uh, where we employ a lot of people, especially, uh, and, and housing them um, in, in, yeah, I mean, the buildings are all very nice buildings. The, the, I think it's just that the, the real um, health care wasn't there. I mean, how often do they wash the building down? You know, how often do they, you know, uh, have do they have cleaners that come around and clean the toilet facilities and all that? We're almost at. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. That, uh, Captain, uh, we're almost at three million cases now. Oh, wow! There you go. Yeah. So. But deaths of two hundred thousand. Death two hundred thousand, three hundred million cases, two million cases, but. I mean, it's by, by percentage, it's very small, yeah. but it did enough to stop the whole world. 
Yes. Yes. Sorry, I talked too much. Nice. Okay, sir. So, okay, it is really very informative. Yes, sir. Thank you very <laughs> much. Very comprehensive. It's nice to be listening to your uh, wisdom and uh, your point of views. Okay. So okay, thank love. you for your, we thank you for your time and we wish you well and we hope that um, we'll get to meet each other again when <laughs> yeah when when things get back to normal next time. Um, so I'd like to come and visit Singapore again soon too. <laughs> and nice catching up with you, Georgine. And lovely. Thank you, thank you very, very, much, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, yes, sir. God, God bless. bless. Bye. 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 Stay safe. Bye.